Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Cesar from Tampere University of Technology. This is work I did in uh, Alto University uh, in Finland, together with Bill Bromley and Yuval. So the title is Make Sure DSA Signing Expon Exponentiations Really Are Constant Time. Spoiler alert, they are not. So. <laughs> Okay, so well, this is the agenda. I'm going to introduce um, what I'm presenting, uh, what are our contributions, a bit of background of DSA, uh, which is similar to what Daniel presented already, uh, DSA in practice, um, the software defect that allows to exploit DSA, the exploiting techniques that we use, and how we victimize uh, SSH and TLS, and the conclusions. Okay, so let me start by talking a, a, bit, a bit about OpenSSL. So as uh, some of you have heard, OpenSSL, it's a fairly used library that uh, provides crypto primitive script implementation for some, uh, for a lot of uh, different protocols, including TLS and OpenSSH to keep our communications tra transactions secure. So that's nice, but at the same time we have um, uh, cash, cash attacks, cash timing attacks, right? So the, process, the components of the, of the processor, they leak uh, information. The prefecture, uh, the data cache, instruction cache, we have heard some of these uh, previous days, and it's really interesting, novel. And specifically, the cache memory has uh, different levels. So some caches only have uh, two levels, some others have three or maybe even more. So this provides a timing difference that we can exploit. And cache timing attacks are implementation attacks and um, are passive attacks. Okay, so our contributions. Uh, we identify a security weakness in OpenSSL. Well, that's not new, right? Uh, we describe how to combine different techniques uh, to attack an unsafe algorithm and, and recover the secret key. We apply this attack to TLS and SSH protocols using the DSA signature algorithm. Uh, we construct a lattice problem, we solve it to recover the, the secret key. All right, so basic uh, DSA course, very similar to what Daniel said. So Alice and Bob, they want to communicate, they want to send, Alice wants to send a message and a signature of that message. So Alice uh, chooses a, a randomly a K in this range, computes the signature, which is a R and S, it's a topo. R is compute G to the K, J, G is the generator, key is the nonce, uh, mod Q, and also computes the hash of the message that is going to send. And then computes S, multiplying the secret key with R that was previously computed. Uh, it's added to the hash of the message and then multiplied with the inverse of K, mod Q, and then it sends uh, all the, all this triple to Bob, the message and the, and the signature. And then Bob uh, takes the message, hashes it, and then verifies that it's, it's a, a valid signature. So exponentiation mod Q, it's a computation, computationally expensive operation. And failing to produce a random nonce uh, breaks the security of DSA as uh, Daniel mentioned before. So we need efficient algorithms to, to compute this, uh, this uh, operation. And through the time, there have been different algorithms, 2K array, and then the sliding window exponentiation, fixed window exponentiation, and then Montgomery ladder. So there have been several algorithms. And basically, most of, uh, of, of them, if not all, they reduce uh, the exponentiation to a sequence of squares and multiplications, similar to, to what Daniel mentioned. Instead of uh, double and adds, it's squares and multiplications. But the thing is, these different algorithms, not all of them are, are constant safe. They're not constant, so they're not uh, cache timing safe. 
So DSA in practice, DSA in practice, there is no real consensus on key sizes. So we have different key sizes, but all of them are depend on the standard. And NIST um, recommends <laughs> using two, four, eight uh, key sizes for P, two, five, six for, for Q. They are acceptable, and you shouldn't be using 1024P and 160-bit Q because they are considered legacy. And of course, everyone follows that, right? So SSH, uh, the transport layer protocol, lists DSA as required. So SSH requires DSA and with this key type. And at the same time, if you use an open SSH tool to, to generate the key, uh, SSH key gen, it defaults to uh, legacy use key. So this is a problem, right? Except that it, it doesn't work anymore for version post, uh, post version 7.0. But unfortunately, today there was a talk, oh, it's not visible, but there was a, a really nice talk today earlier about this SSH. Basically, only about 0.7% are using SSH po uh, version 7.0 or, or newer. So that leaves a lot of, of attack surface. Now, well, how it's implemented in, in, in OpenSSL. In 2005, uh, OpenSSL developers, they committed two changes to the, to the code, to the base code, to uh, make better the exponentiation method. Uh, the, one of them was uh, implement a fixed window exponentiation method instead of the sliding window, uh, thanks to the work by, by Colin Percival. So that was one of the changes. And the other one was make sure the ESA signing exponentiations really are constant time. This was in 2005. So in this change, what they do is uh, they set the bit length of Q as one bit more than the bit of, of Q. So it's a fixed length. And to prevent some other type of attacks, so for, for that, they compute uh, KQ as K plus once or, or twice uh, the size of, of Q. So they introduce these two changes. And well, in the code, it looks like this. Uh, they have K, so they, they create KQ. They copy the content of K to KQ, and then they, they add once or, or twice the size. KQ, and then they perform the actual exponentiation. The problem is that they use these flags, the ESA flag, no exp, uh, flag constant time, to indicate that it should run the constant time version of the algorithm. And the, the B and copy method doesn't propagate this flag. So when it's copied from K to KQ, this, this flag set here is lost, and then it goes and computes this method, but it always skips that method calls this one, and then always skips this constant time. It never goes in here. So the, the flag is useless, and it's been useless since 2005. Great. So the flag's not propagating, the code path follow is not side channel safe and non-constant time algorithm is in use. Which algorithm? The sliding window exponentiation algorithm. So I'm not going to give too many details about the algorithm, but two things is that uh, it, cons it consists of two parts, a pre-computation, where a table is computed with a square, and then uh, several multiplications. Those are used later to perform the actual exponentiation. So here it checks if the bit is uh, zero, then it performs a squaring, r times r is just a square. If it's one, then it computes a, a multiplication. Um, so how did we exploit this? Uh, open is a share library, so we can use uh, techniques such as uh, flush and reload technique, that identif identifies access to memory lines, 
uh, heads and cache messes and makes use of this nice CL flush command. And then at the same time, we, we use this performance degradation technique that slows down the processor, so it allows us to have a better trace of the sequence of operations. And finally, we solve a lattice problem that uh, returns the secret key. Right, so this is the attack scenario. We have uh, our big team calling OpenSSL, performing a uh, uh, signature, consisting of squares and multiplications in one core. In another core, we have the attacker performing the flush and reload attack. And in the third core, it's degrading the processor. We, uh, the, 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 all of these uh, are linked to the OpenSSL library. So our test setup uh, consisted of uh, Intel Core 5, uh, with the, uh, 16 gigabytes of RAM, uh, Haswell architecture, uh, running uh, Ubuntu 64 bits and OpenSSL version 1.02H, which was uh, it's this year's version from March, I think. And we trace the sequence of the squares and, and multiplications. So it calls, uh, OpenSSL calls these two methods, the square and multiplication, to, to compute the signature or the exponentiation and we trace the sequence, and we recover something like this. Well, a raw, a raw signal, it doesn't look as nice as this, but then we apply signal processing techniques, and this uh, technique uh, results in a sequence like this of the squares. This is the pre-computation part, one square and several multiplications, and then there's the actual uh, exponentiation sequence of squares and multiplications. Okay, so that this is how it looks in, in a nice graph. Uh, we have cache hits and ca cache misses, hits and, and misses for the two probes, uh, multiply and square. This is the latency measure and this is the, the time, the points uh, recorded for 1024 and 2048 uh, key, key sizes. So unfortunately, we, we cannot recover the whole key just by looking at the trace. So we only took, take the least significant bits through, from, from each sequence. And the idea is the same. We capture uh, a lot of signatures and we put this into a lattice problem. The messages, the signatures, and the traces to recover the secret key. For the lattice, we use a cluster of, it had uh, hun no, th yeah, hundreds of, of uh, cores of mixed of those two. Uh, we use a lattice reduction, BKC with the default for Sage, which is, is size 10, and then lattice enumeration using Babai's nearest plane. So, this table shows the least significant bit patterns that we took. We fixed to three. We took signatures that had this from here to up to eight um, bits to recover. And this it was repeated for SSH and TLS. Uh, the lattice attack took uh, six minutes and 40 minutes for 1,024 and 2,048 key sizes. So, okay, we attacked the DSA part in OpenSSL, but this is used in, in some other protocols such as OpenSSH and, well, SSH and TLS. So we decided to attack that as well. Um, the scenario in, open in the OpenSSH is that you have legitimate access to the server, right? So with your credentials, you can connect to the server, and then in the server, you put your own spy process, you leave it running, and then you can start connections with the server, uh, capturing all the, all the traces, and then later you can send those traces back to you and compute the, the secret key of the, of the server. Uh, similar for TLS. 
So we attack um, S tunnel and OpenSSH. Uh, this version is the one that is stuck from Ubuntu uh, 14. So it's all the versions from there and before are vulnerable to this attack, and as well for S tunnel. So this is a scenario. Uh, the attacker puts his uh, spy process here and the grading process and leave it there running. At the same time, it's uh, eavesdrop, eavesdropping this connection, so it captures the messages, exchange, and the, the signatures, and then sends the, the, the traces back and then computes the, the private key. So what was the result of this? Uh, OpenSSL issue a CVE. Uh, the vulnerability was not only found in OpenSSL, but also in LibreSSL and BoringSSL. And the problem here is that OpenSSL developers chose an insecure default behavior. So the code is vulnerable. Um, I don't know why they chose that, but the logic would be that it's easier to implement the corner cases where you want to, to make it secure, and I don't know why would they want to compute a signature in an insecure way, but that was the logic behind it, I assume. Um, it's recommended to disable cipher switches that have DSA functionality. Uh, I believe it's, in TLS is not widely used, but in OpenSSH, if you are using the SA keys, uh, stop using them and switch to something more secure, such as uh, the um, elliptic curves uh, keys, uh, Edward curve keys. Those are much more secure, smaller. And, well, the SA in TLS, it's, no, it's a minority. No, a lot of people use it anymore but still is in use and still supported. I mean, we have DSA, uh, elliptic curve DSA, why, why would we use all DSA? But the thing is, well, the government, at least the US government is still using, <coughs> using it, so they still support it. And at the same time, they are still vulnerable to this type of attacks. So that's why it's still in use. And that's all, thank you. Have any questions? Um, questions? Here I see Kirun, University Bochum. What I think was interesting was this uh, flag propagation problem in OpenSSL. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask, is it a general problem and how have you found it just by manual analysis or is it, there a way how to uh, do it on large scale and maybe find different bugs which are quite similar to this? Okay, uh, well, how we found it, uh, we were looking to the code with the debugger and then Billy was showing me, okay, you should take this code path because it's uh, safe. So we were going through the code but then start skipping that part of the code. Mm -hmm. And he asked me, did you modify the code in any way? I said, no, no, no. And then that's how we found this with this bug. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, luck, a bit of luck about that. How to find several things like this. I guess it's, a dif it's, it's difficult to make that kind of test, regression test to check that the right code path is taken every time. It's possible. I think it's an interesting um, research topic, and I don't know if anyone is working on that. Okay, we have plenty of time for more questions. So maybe I, I ask one follow-up question yeah. on that. So in, couldn't they have detected it using testing? Um, in, are there any good testing tools for checking whether implementations are vulnerable to these kind of attacks? Uh, you mean OpenSSL? If they 
tested it. Yeah, but there are tools that can detect uh, problems like that. Um, well, I'm, I'm assuming there are tools that check uh, that the right code part is taken, but... Uh, I, I meant more um, in terms of looking at the, the cache behavior, whether you oh, have okay. a tool that looks at the cache behavior, a bit maybe like what you did, yeah, but yeah. Not more automated. Well, I'm not aware of any tool like that. That would be interesting, yeah. Okay. I, um, we have more time for questions, so I, especially I don't want to start too early because then people that want to switch, I, don't, I suspect that this, um, for this session there won't be all that many people that, that are switching, but as we have time, as we may as well um, use it for questions. So think of, think of smart questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I have... <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, to attack TLS, uh, a passive adversary is enough, while for the sage, uh, you actually... Um, Need an active adversary. Yeah. Uh, so the reason why uh, uh, you need an active adversary for this stage is that the content of the signature is not observable uh, yeah. to a passive adversary. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so could you make a case that um, a good design practice would be to uh, include uh, something in the signature not, that is not observable by a, a passive adversary? Would that be a good design uh, pattern, or do you think that's overkill? Well, I believe it would be good to prevent these kind of attacks. Uh, I'm not too aware of uh, the specifics of TLS, if it will create any other issues with the, the flow of TLS, but that would be recommended to be able to, to compute the signature using some shared secret between the two parties. So that way it's like open SSH and it requires uh, an active attack and not only looking at the, at the traffic between the, the two parties, yeah. So hey. you said uh, you uh, use a degradation, so you show a, a, a nice picture uh, a picture of the uh, measurements of the cache, cache timing, so that yeah. you can see that. Okay, now now you can see, uh, you can uh, uh, read out which is the like like what kind of y and zero. But it, I get I assume that you actually uh, attack on the for example you have a, a simulated server where probably only one the other the, the victim is only using the share library. But if assuming if it's a it's a server like with many other process also using this, uh, also using SSL or something? Yeah. Do you get a lot of noise or something? Yeah, you get noise, and for that reason you require more signatures, but it's possible to still recover the, the secret key. Yeah. Uh, I forgot, how many signatures did you? Oh, sorry, uh, it's here in this table. Uh, so, for OpenSSH, uh, we have two, 260 handshakes, 260 signatures and 580 for TLS for these key sizes. Yeah. Um, more questions? So I, have, I have one question. Okay. I have several, but I have to choose. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, you, I think you, you described that your attack needed uh, three cores, or at least your setup had three cores. Sorry? So you, I, I think you described your attack, you showed that you use three different cores. Yeah. Right? So is that like absolutely necessary? What happens if you have only two cores, for instance? Um, what's the relevance of this? Well, we use this attack scenario because it was easier to, to, to see what the degrade, degrading attacker is doing and what the flush and reload is doing. So I believe it's possible to have two cores, one running the big team and the other one running only the attack uh, to perform this. If you have only attack. a single core, it's not possible. Right. Just stupid questions. That's a good question. Okay. Well, we'll have to try that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So let's thank the speaker again.